Well, I'm gearing up to uh, take another trip, and this is going to be a uh, work-related trip coming up. We have a scraping class. It's going to be another one of the uh, Richard King scraping classes that he is putting on over at my friend John Terry's shop. This is the same location that we did uh, a year ago. It's uh, about a year to the date over in Santa Rosa Beach. So going to be going over there and um, kind of hanging out with the class and also going to be able to visit with my friends Lance, Keith Rucker, and of course John. And the four of us are planning on working on either some of John's machinery or maybe even one of Lance's machines there as well. We're going to be doing some uh, probably disassembly and working on some of the uh, scraping that might need to be done on some of the equipment that's over there. So I'm gearing up trying to get all my tools packed up, all of my scraping gear packed up. We're going to be heading over there very soon. Uh, we're camping in one of the local campgrounds there for the week uh, to attend the scraping class and then after that uh, we're going to stop off at another uh, campground on the way down to Lance's for a couple days and then uh, after that we're going to head down to uh, Lance's shop and I'm going to spend some time with him and we're going to we're going to he's going to help me out with a uh, granite surface plate project that I have and I'll show you that in just a minute but I wanted to go ahead and recap the Stoker engine saga and uh, where we're at on that okay so you might have saw in a recent video I was showing you up to date on the problems I was having with clearance on uh, getting in here to doing the cuts in the two channels that needs to be done the uh, build up that was put in here needs to be cut back to size and I've tried every way that I can to get the shaper the tool head and the tool to fit in here and this setup right here, it just will not work. I don't have enough clearance. I know I've had a lot of suggestions from folks on try this or try that. And believe me, I've thought about all those, all those suggestions, but no matter which way I slice it, I don't have the clearance to get in here and cut this right here. If you turn this tool on an angle, you're gonna be hitting something else. The tool head or this body is gonna be hitting somewhere. You're not gonna be able to get in there. I've had a lot of suggestions on why don't you just make your own tools for this? I don't want to make my own custom tools for this job for a one-time use. And quite frankly, I don't know if, if a homemade tool is going to get the job done. I would rather use a nice, high-quality Ford steel tool holder to hold a tool bit and not just try to cobble some tools up together to get in there and do this weld right there. It's going to be... It's just going to be way too time consuming to come up with custom made tools to get in there and do this one time job. And I, that's the labor that I just don't want to spend on it. Okay. So after all the suggestions, I've decided to, I'm not going to go forward with the Stoker engine. And I talked to uh, Keith Rucker. I called him up. We had a conversation about it. And Keith would actually like to try to tackle this job himself. He's recently added a uh, Lucas, I believe it's a Lucas horizontal boring mill to his shop. He's got some videos on that. And uh, of course, he's got his big planer restoration he's been doing too. But what he was telling me was that he would actually like to try to machine this himself in that Lucas horizontal boring mill. But he's still, he's still got to get it set up. He's, you know, he's got to finish doing his cleaning. He wants to get a little practice on it too so that he can get in there and be familiar with the controls and how to uh, properly operate it. But what he has done is that he's come up with a, uh, I want to say it's a number five Morse taper end mill holder and a, a really long reach end mill that he thinks he may be able to get in here with. Reach down in here and uh, do the cutting. I'm a little skeptical if that idea is going to work. I mean, the uh, concept of it is uh, for sure it would get in there and uh, do some cutting. But when you have an end mill hanging out there 12 inches or, or so, whatever it is, plus the spindle of the board mill hanging out to hold the tool, I just don't know if that's a good recipe for um, uh, rigidity, should I say. But I think that's what Keith wants to try. So that's what's going to happen. So 
I'm getting ready to go ahead and take this out of the shaper, get it out of the shaper, and I'll get it over here on my pallet jack where I can move it around. And what I would actually like to do is try to schedule a couple of days, maybe in February, where uh, Abby and I can uh, load in the truck, load up the truck in the camper, and take this up there to Keith's shop, drop it off, and just spend a couple time, uh, a couple days up there in uh, Tifton, hanging out with Keith. I'd like to see his shop and his. Uh, you know, updated machinery and things that he's been doing there. Cause it's been a few years since I've been to a shop. So that's where we're at on the Stoker engine. We're going to give it back to Keith and he is going to attempt doing the machine work inside this guy. So I mentioned to you about my granite surface plate. That's this guy right here. I bought this at an auction probably about five years ago. If I had to guess, I really don't remember how long it's been, but about five years, I bought that at a local auction for 50 bucks granite plate with the stand just like you see it right there now i've never had this measured to see just how flat it is or what grade it is it was a uh, pretty roughly used granite surface plate that does have some if you rub your fingers across there you can feel like little you know divots in there where you know it's been chipped out but overall i think it's a good i think it's a good granite surface plate I've done some checks using my indicators, doing some sweeps across here, and it seems to be pretty close. But what we're gonna do, I'm gonna load this up in the truck and I'm gonna take it with me. And uh, after the scraping class, I'm headed down to Lance's shop and I'm gonna spend a few days there with him. We're gonna work on some projects. This being one of the projects right here. Lance has been pretty active in learning the, the art and the trade of lapping. Um, not only scraping but lapping uh, granite surface plates he's got the he's got the proper tools to measure it with and he's gaining the knowledge that it requires to understand what's going on and how to accomplish this job so I'm gonna take that down there and the first thing we're gonna do I don't know if it's the first thing we're gonna do but what we're gonna do you see this stand right here any granite surface plate should be sitting on three points that's how it's designed. That's how it should be sitting. You, you, you should have two points on one side and one on the other. And you can see if I get the camera down here that it's not sitting on three points. It's just sitting in a, in a frame. So we're going to modify this uh, frame. We'll, we'll weld some angle, angle iron in there and make some little pads so that this thing will be sitting on the proper three points as it's supposed to. But we'll probably do once we get there we'll go ahead and set it up on three points that way to kind of start getting settled out but we'll modify the cart and then we're going to go through the process of lapping this thing we'll inspect it to see where it's at we'll see if there's any holes in it or low spots and see how flat it is from side to side and then after that we'll we'll do our uh, lapping on it to get it back in the spec so i'm pretty excited about getting this done and uh, I'm just so thankful that, you know, I have Lance in my corner and he's uh, willing to help me with this project right here. And we're going to get it done. So this is uh, something I'm really looking forward to. And I'm going to have the cameras and we're going to bring you along the way. All right. Made it down here to Santa Rosa Beach to our friend John Terry's shop. We got Lance here next to me. Good morning, everybody. So we, we're here a couple of days early and uh, me, Lance and John are kind of kind of mess around with some machinery we've got so we've got your uh, Rockford planer that we're gonna mess with right yeah is that the plan he's got a I don't know if we've ever shown that yet but I don't know <coughs> so you, you, you showed yours unloaded well they've seen mine yeah. so the the uh, Rockford planer that we unloaded here at John's shop but Lance has got one almost identical to that except it's the short model it's the it's the 36 inch bed right, i believe right, 36 inch. so he had got that from a long machine tool out in texas and uh, had it yeah. brought up here and uh, so anyway the plan is i think we're going to go pick that up in the warehouse bring it over here and that's going to be one of the projects that we'll be working on this week during the scraping class which would be me you uh keith and john will be messing with that i think we might we're going to mess around with some uh surf surface plates as yeah. well possibly brought my calibration stuff for surface plates we'll do some surface plate lapping so okay i guess Good. you get, get video of all that yeah i'm just gonna have the camera we're, we're just gonna take some video of whatever's going on but i wanted to get some preliminary stuff to kind of 
just to kind of show what we're going to be up to before the actual class starts. Yeah, it's going to be and, a fun week. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. I always love coming up here to John's. He's got some cool machines. Yeah. That's another reason I got the camera. I want to go show him the uh, Summit. And the Cincinnati. And, and the, the Shaper. The yep. Last year we showed the Cincinnati mill where uh, they were scraping in the ram well john's got all that put back together so hopefully we can fire that up and see it run this time too well we got the cincinnati shaper and the big cincinnati mill that's you, right i don't think you've shown the big green cincinnati mill i actually i showed that in a oh, video it was in the other warehouse it was in another warehouse because yeah. i actually said there might be a possibility that i could maybe buy this from john but i think john decided no, I think I'm going to keep this and, and uh, work he, on it. He just tore it down, took all the clutches yeah. out of it, figured it all out, rewired it. So it, okay. might, it might be a little tough to get out of his hands. Yeah. I don't, one thing about John is that he, he's really come to love machinery, old machinery, yeah. yes, you know, the old manual machines. And I think yeah. he really just loves, he gets them at auctions, yeah. and he likes to bring them here and tinker with them, take them yeah. apart, fix them, repair them, and put them back together. And that's, that's like his, yeah. that's what keeps him busy. That's what. That's what keeps him happy. Yeah, that big so. green Cincinnati I bought because he couldn't get registered for that auction. Oh, and then okay. He paid me back, and he went up and got it. But uh, he's put a lot of time in it. I, I'm looking forward to seeing it run because I haven't seen it run yet. Yeah, so. me too. Yeah. Well, let's go over there and show him the machines. We'll do a little. We'll do a little walk around and and uh, show you his. Uh, his uh, new acquisitions and we we did show John shop in the uh, the previous when we were here working on the Cincinnati so he's got a lot of really nice equipment in his shop right here so there's the big Cincinnati there that we were just uh, talking about and he's been uh, so he's been working on this apparently you said oh yeah yeah I think um, that and I, I'll let John tell you the story, but I think what happened was that mill was sent out by the previous owner to have it worked on because of some of the clutches, something, something in the drive system wasn't right. And I believe when it came back, this um, speed dial, I believe it was wired incorrectly. Okay. Because there's apparently two different wiring diagrams, and John finally figured it all out because he couldn't get some of the internal clutches to engage. And now it's working perfectly. He, John's a smart dude. He's very intelligent. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we sit around and talk about some of the things he does, and yeah. I'm always I'm always amazed at how uh, smart and how well, how much he gets done. He maintains a lot of large equipment for some of these commercial businesses here. So he, right. And he's a sharp guy, and so yeah, it's a. It's this a is a project. beast of a mill right here. You got all power feeds and rapids everywhere. Yeah. So that's a cool one there. Looks like he's got a couple of his granite plates. I'm gonna set my coffee down. That must be, is this that one that he had in the crate that was yeah, boxed this up? Is, this is brand new. I, I mean, it, obviously it's probably made in China. I don't, I don't I remember he had one that was imported that was in a crate. So there's no, is there no name on it? Uh, it's just a certificate on it. Yeah, but, um, okay. So that one's brand new. I guess you're going to check it though, right? And yeah, see where it's at? Gonna, yeah, we're going to calibrate it here. Okay. And then this yeah. is the one you'd be checking? Yeah, this is the one I actually bought for him down in... Um, Florida at a Southwest Florida at an auction I did. Okay. And this plate's actually really good, but I think um, it's it, there's an area back here that they had turned in the back when I checked it with the repeatometer. It had a hole in it, so this okay. isn't that big, you know. I just I just got done with my three foot by six foot, so this, this doesn't look like a very big project to me. So I'm I'm sure we're going to be lapping on this. Yeah, it looks to be maybe a 36 by 36. I think so. Six inch thick. Yeah. But it's a really nice pink stair. I mean, that's a nice plate. Really nice plate. Yep. All right. So there's his newest lathe project. And he's actually, he's completely finished with it now. Yep. Um, it's a summit. It's one of the older summits. It's yep. European made. Now, he had the bed ground, correct? Yep. He sent it up to a company in Ohio and had the bed ground. And, and then, then, and then y'all worked on scraping yeah. the saddle. Yeah. He pulled it all apart. Of course, he redid everything. Um, I, he pulled apart and checked the inside of the headstock, but he painted the whole thing, cleaned it all up. And then the only part I participated in was um, he turkited the saddle, and um, and I came down and helped him scrape the saddle for alignment for the headstock, and um, and then of course the cross slide and that, that stuff. But he did the rest of it himself. Yeah, so. it, yeah he uh, repainted it, yep. I believe, put it, cleaned it up, put a paint job on it. And it works really well, nice and smooth. The other thing he did, Adam, was he remade this 
this uh, travel system, you know, to move the tailstock. Okay. So um, he had to I'm, remake this. This was missing and broken. So this, this was this was uh, how it was. Is it on the uh, the American pacemakers yep. like this? And they were common to get broken because yep. as you crank them back, you would hit the casting or hit this, and it would break them. There's a there's a story behind that gear in there, um, and I don't remember. It's like an oddball tooth and size. And he actually <laughs> found a company that he bought a like a 10 inch or a 12 inch length of it for cheap. Oh, for the the, the gear and then yeah, machined it. Was, it. Yeah, you know, and that's it was cool. A piece of spline shaft, but it was the correct gear ratio, and yeah. he cut it down and made it. So okay. Well, it's a good-looking lathe. It's uh, nice and heavy, solid casting, casted bases here. Uh, obviously, it looks like the he, either he don't have or it was missing the chip pans when he got it. It is a gap bed, and uh, so it must be a 28-inch swing. We see Summit 28 there. So that's going to be a good lathe form right there. It's it's tight. It's it's in exceptional condition now. Good. And he found this one at auction too, right? Yeah. I won't okay. Pay what it paid for. <laughs> well, it's auction, auction yeah, prices. Auction price there for sure. yeah. Well, let's turn around here and look at the uh, look at the uh, Cincinnati. By the way, some of the guys are over there working. This is, you know, they do woodworking over here as well. So that's just part of the the shop atmosphere. So here's the Cincinnati Shaper. We showed scraping in the ramways right there. So the guys worked on the inside uh, ramways, and of course the the main ramways there and got them all scraped in good and apparently he's got it back together and running so uh, hopefully today maybe we can get it fired up and and see it moving a little bit here but you can see now i'm always griping about how my gne has such a small table it was like they took a 24 inch table and put it on the 32 and, and just use it but you can see how much bigger the box tables are on the on these type of shapers there and that's one thing that i miss off mine is that I have such a short table. I think it's like 18 inches long. Yeah. On a 32 inch swing. Yeah, and he's got the, what is this uh, where it kicks the tool? Uh, tool lifter. Tool it's yeah. the automatic tool lifter, yeah, and this is the one for Cincinnati yeah. right there. So I, I love that he's got this because I could copy this yep. design and put it on mine one of these days. But yeah. every time it retracts, this rod actually pushes forward and, and actually lifts the tool. See that right there? Yeah, it's got like a little uh, drag device inside there. Yep. Yeah, it's like a it's it's like a brake shoe. Yeah. It's sort of just like a brake shoe in the back. Yeah. I can't get by here. I'll let me see. We'll go back here and take a look at it. It's such simple engineering. Like, you know, yeah, and yeah. it looks like you can adjust it to yeah, put more. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yep. So it's just a brake, and when every time it goes back there, it just kind of puts pressure on the rod and kicks it forward. And kicks the tool out and it only takes just a little bit you see just a little bit so that is cool so i'm glad to see he finally got the the big sensi back and running order now okay guys i'm gonna have to try to talk you through some of these clips that i took i've been having some uh, really bad uh electronic issues uh during this time that i was at john's and my camera was not working right. So I want to begin here and give a mention to Steve Barton at Solid Rock Machine Shop. This is his three quarter inch bar that he that he makes and sells. And uh, he was kind enough to send me one of these boring bars right there. Uh, it was actually at Lance's and he was holding on to it and, and he brought it to me for the class. So thank you, Steve. Check out Solid Rock Machine Shop if uh, you're interested in some of these carbide bars. They're double ended. Uh, one side has the uh, TPG style of insert like you can see right there and then the opposite end has the uh, screw down insert that's got the uh, chip breaking profile molded into it I can't I don't recall offhand what the insert number is for that so I'll apologize there but we wanted to go ahead and, and put this bar to work which is exactly what we were doing because we started building a roller for Lance which uh, we'll go into more detail later on what we're going to be using this roller for or what Lance is going to be using this roller for. So there's John. He's the owner of the shop here. His lathe and he is uh, putting a hole through this piece of A2 steel for us. And this is the part, this is the, this is the steel that we're going to be using to uh, machine this roller for Lance. 
Lance grabbed the camera and wanted to get a few shots of me running John's lathe here. So what I'm doing is I'm using that solid rock machine carbide tip boring bar. And we're going to be putting a, an inch and a quarter bore is what we put through the center of that. And uh, we'll be counter boring both sides of this roller to, uh, for, to, for a bearing to press in there. And the reason we landed on the inch and a quarter bore is because John had an expanding mandrel that had the one of the sleeves for, for inch and a quarter. So that's what I'm showing you right there. That's an expanding mandrel. You can put a part on there like that. Uh, bump it down that is on a tapered fit and so it'll hold the inside of the roller there whenever we go to turn the outside of it All right, so there's our uh, there's our roller right there, and what we're going to do, the guys are going to go ahead. They're getting ready to fire up the heat treat oven, and they are going to do a, a a heat treat on this, harden it up, and then if we need to, we'll come back and uh, finish out the uh, bores and the OD to make everything true and concentric right there. So we'll come out here and take a look. Looks like they're getting ready to get the uh, oven programmed. Well, you already got a program for that. Uh, you already got a program for that. Do you remember doing that? I don't have your program that high. I've got a program probably well, you, for uh, you've already got user one on it. She's tight. Yeah, it's not a lot of rooms in there. I wish I'd got the bigger room. No. We may have it maybe okay. somewhere too. Alright, we're ready to do some uh, oil quenching. On Lance's part here. He's trying to get a hold of it, huh? You want me to do my wire trick? Yeah. You want me to leave it like that? No, wire it. We can get it in. Uh, tell me when you got it. Ready? You got it. Another day. It's all yours. All right, John's going to oil quench it now. And Lance is going to reset the oven to do a temper on it. All right, so here's our here's our piece after uh, heat treating and tempering. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go ahead and set it back uh, on the on the mandrel on the arbor there, and we'll turn the OD. And then once we turn the OD, we'll be able to chuck it. Uh, finish one side for the bearing, flip it around, indicate it, make sure it's true, and then bore the other one. This isn't a, a super critical part either uh, that we're making, but it's going to be very, very close. So we'll go ahead and get it finished out now. So here's that inch and a quarter expanding mandrel that I was talking about earlier in the clip. Just bump your, bump your part down on the mandrel and it tightens up and holds the ID. And we're using that to true up the OD. Yeah. Well, he'd have some kind of diamond lap in there if it was exactly <laughs> precise. We're just using a carbide boring bar. <laughs> he didn't show making his. His uh, bread roller tool. Yeah. Uh, it, didn't, it would have been probably ground on, you know. Yeah, like a yeah. spindle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not used to this being in this position to disengage. I'm used to just pulling it up from the bottom on, on my machine. All right, so I'm just finishing out the roller there. We, we've already bored the other side. You got a half dial press for the bearing, and now we're just finishing out this side right here. We left 10 thousandths to clean up.
Well, I don't know at what point you're going to be seeing this video, but I, I needed to uh, film this because, um, first of all, I'm extremely frustrated and upset right now. Uh, at least that helped out a little bit. We, we're out here having a couple of drinks. This is after the, uh, the class. We're home. And uh, anyway, so every video that I shot today using my uh, Hero 9, I got zero audio on. Absolutely nothing. No audio. And then some of the clips from yesterday, I didn't get any audio either. So it means I'm having to like to use the video that I took. I'm going to have to go in and do some voiceover so that you guys can kind of hear what it was and save some of those shots right there. Not necessarily something that I want to do every time I edit videos, do voiceover because the cameras are supposed to pick up the audio. So at first I was uh, thinking that maybe these, uh, this Rode wireless mic is the culprit that it's not working right. Okay. I don't know this. You have your media mod right here. This is the uh, the mod that the Hero 9 slides into. You've got a USB port right in there that slides into the camera. And on the back of it, you have a port there for the mic. All right, you have that. And then that this plugs into the, uh, the mic, the Rode mic, okay? So I'm thinking, Maybe it's this that's not working. Maybe the cord's getting this problem. Maybe it's this connection here or the USB. Something is unreliable and it's frustrating because this is the worst I've ever experienced this. And it's pointless to take all this footage to share with you guys if I can't use it. You know what I mean? So there's a, there's a, there's a lot of times I'm doing filming that it's hard to retake this stuff because it's completely candid off the cuff. I'm showing you guys what we've been doing out in the shop and you can't go back and reshoot that stuff. All right. So I just shot this video that we're doing just now to inform you guys of what all of it was going on and saying I was going to go back to using the Hero 9 with just the built-in mics. That always seems to work. The video that I just shot using this also did not have audio at all. Zero audio. So I guess that is telling me that this camera is not working right. The Hero 9 camera. It's got to be the camera. I don't know what the deal is. So I went in there and got my Hero 8. That's the one I've been using a while. Of course, the battery was dead. I left those batteries in my toolbox back at John's shop. So Abby's using my iPhone to film this video right here. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go back to using my Hero 8 camera and then I'll try to get some more footage tomorrow and of course the rest of the week of what it was that we've been up to and what we've been doing and I'm going to cross my fingers that the Hero 8 will go back to doing what I need to do so it's extremely disappointing that this expensive new Hero 9 GoPro camera is not working it doesn't make any sense but now I'm very apprehensive to use this use the Rode mic because I've never had these kind of problems I've, I've had a few audio problems here and there but nothing to this extent. I I have I shot probably 20, 25 clips today of a lot of different things, including the students doing their scraping, some of the projects Lance and John and I were working on, and no audio, absolutely no audio. So frustrating. So uh, hopefully tomorrow things will go better. We'll go back to using the Hero 8 camera because that's always worked. All right. So. Thought I'd give you guys this little notice, but this right here, this guy right here is extremely unreliable. Unreliable. Not good. Not good. All right, guys. Well, here is the finished or the completed part that we were making there. This is the roller that uh, Lance was wanting machined. And I'm going to let you, I'm going to let Lance uh, describe what it is he, that he's going to be doing with this. But it turned out pretty good. This was a piece of A2 tool steel. And we, of course, machined it, heat treated it. I turned the shaft there and we got it pressed in. And he's just going to be using it kind of like a bread roller. So here's Lance. <laughs> yeah. and he's going he's gonna to tell you what he's doing with it. This is a piece of A2 that I had in the shop. And um, I've been using some janky bearings on kind of a... A heavy plastic uh, shaft and he and didn't want to show that no I'm not showing <laughs> that. I mean it works just fine but it took a lot of time to actually impregnate this diamond into cast iron so this is a hardened roller a2 we were actually able to get some spots on here that were 64 Rockwell C which was pretty surprising because that's almost like an as cooled or as quenched number um, 
But anyway, all this is is like a diamond bread roller. We're just using it to uh, embed diamond particles into these cast iron laps. If anybody's watched Robin Renzetti's show, he's got one, I don't know, somewhat similar to this. But um, yeah, so I brought it up here and John's got his heat treat set up. So I thought we could go ahead and get it machined, get some bearings in there. The beautiful thing about being at John's is pretty much anything you need is already on the shelf. Right, he's got so, it here. He's got a great collection of tools right. and machinery yeah. here for us to, yeah. to use. So, um, you know, the short story is, in fact, we're gonna go ahead and lap a real small plate today. Try not to overdo this. But um, this is some synthetic diamond that I bought. I've used it, um, I've used it before. Okay, that's 10 times more than we need, but that's all right. <laughs> Fortunately, it's cheap. So, um, I think if anybody's, um, again, watch Robin Ranzetti, he mixes this with, I think somebody said, an alcohol and um, uses a little fantail artist brush to spread it out, which is kind of a cool way to do it. This is way overcharging this lap, but we have a, a small service plate over there that's got a hole in it that's in excess of a thou and a half. So I doubt that I'll get that out, but I well, told explain him to him. on it to what, what you're doing and why why you're doing this, what you're gonna be using this for. And by the way, this is one of his cast iron surface plates that he just recently scraped in and he's gonna be using this as yeah. a lap. Yeah, so this plate is I think right around 50 pounds, which is a good uh, size for a lap, good weight. Um, and so I'm, I scraped it and mastered it to one of my A plates in my shop and I known a granite. And then uh, we're gonna spread, this is actually about 40 micron diamond, evenly as best we can. And then we're gonna use this roller and deeply embed it and basically create a, um, almost like a diamond sandpaper lap okay. for, for, for resurfacing granite surface plates. Okay. And so that's the short story. And um, yeah, we're just gonna use the bread roller to, how does it, how's it feel? Oh, it's fantastic. so much easier than what I was doing before. And it'll take one tenth of the time. So with that the works. hardened OD of the roller, it's uh, the idea is to try to push the diamond down into the cast iron. Yep, we're just embedding it so that it hopefully uh, sticks in there and allows us to do some cutting. It's a little different than uh, uh, putting diamond uh, grains uh, loose on a granite plate and doing a, a sort of, it creates more of a free cutting action or a rolling type cutting action. So anyway, that should be plenty. That's so much easier than what I've been doing for the last year. Great, so that's gonna work out well for you. Yeah. Thanks for my Christmas gift, Adam. Hey, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I could help out there. And of course, John for letting us use his, use his machines. Yeah. All right. So yeah, next just, step is you're gonna you're gonna use that on the on a granite surface plate to yeah. start lapping it in. Yeah, I'm actually gonna leave it probably right here. We're gonna put the granite on top of it. Okay. And uh, and start lapping with it. So. All righty. Yeah, we have about ten times more diamond on there than we need, but like I said, it's some pretty inexpensive synthetic. So, and that plate needs a ton of work. So we'll do our best. All righty. A-bomb torque, huh? I think I tighten that up on you. <laughs> you got over here, uh, Keith, Lance, and John are working on uh, the, uh, the Rockford. They're getting ready to take the uh, table off here pretty soon. I'm over here uh, running the, the Summit lathe. Just Richard wants to do the headstock alignment test later on, so I'm just getting this piece machine ahead of time, and I thought I'd walk down here and take a look at the, uh, the scraping class and the students and just kind of see where they're at on some of their uh, progress and their projects and what they're working on. I think a lot of them are still on the test blocks, but a few of the guys I think may be working on a straight edge or so. Let's come down here and take a look. How you coming along? Good. Okay, great. Uh power flaking at this point okay and doing uh, the uh, power scraping using the biax yep okay great all right Time to get a flat. 
It looks like he's on the power scraper now too, yeah. using the biat. Getting, getting it, getting a start at it. Okay. And I know this is this is your personal straight edge, correct? It is, yes okay. sir. Okay, he's been working on it. Looking good, using the biax as well. I think all the guys have now moved on to the uh, biax. There's the, uh, this is the granite plate that they've been using to uh, check flatness there. Let's see what else we got going on. I think everybody's moved on to uh, the back there. So there's Richard. That's it. I don't want to disturb everybody too much, but they're all working on their uh, their their chest pieces. This is the third day into the class. They still got so today is Friday. They got Saturday and Sunday, and uh, maybe I'll get another shot to uh, share of their of their progress along the way. But we're gonna get back over here on some machines, and let's take a look at this. I believe the guys have this ready to remove. I'm not sure. I'm not over here turning any wrenches, but you can see in here we've got our. This is your hydraulic system that runs the table. I'm gonna get some more clips of this as they make some progress. And uh, I know the goal is to get the table off and do some inspecting, maybe some measuring to see what kind of wear is in it. Getting his limit set. So we got one of this is Lance's uh, cast iron lapping plate that he wants to uh, grind. We're going to be using John's Thompson surface grinder here. Get a little piece back. What's that? Get a little straightened piece back. I helped him do this. Right? Oh yeah, I remember you came yeah. over and helped him. This is the feet. Charge, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> Little payback, huh? What kind of, how much did you feed it down, Lance? One thousandths. Half thousandths. Half a thousandths, okay. So there's a half a thousandths. Thank you. 
Boy, that's sensitive. I didn't mean to come that much. Go ahead, man. I don't want to get in your way. You're just adjusting the flood coolant there. Yeah, that this leading side here doesn't really have much coming out. Seems like a sweet machine. I showed this the other day using the repeat meter A little uh, stare at granite plate. It belongs to one of the students. Just something used that he had bought. And uh, Lance has been lapping it, and you can clearly see the low spot in it now, right? Remember I showed that on the repeat meter Look at that hole right there. And you can also see a hole. It's actually this hole right here, and then there was a little one there. That's yep. Yep. So that's pretty cool. Lance has been using his uh, cast iron lap there. But uh, people ask, well, how do you get the hole in there? Well, there's any number of ways that that could be put in there, but it's obviously people have been using that area for something. I always think that maybe they're using it as an actual lap. Maybe they've got some lapping compound there that they're rubbing something over a period of time, wears it out. But it could be anything, but it's just being used and it, it wears the granite. Yeah, they could have had it, uh, some sort of an indicator stand right there and they were just constantly moving it back and forth, checking parts. You know, right. So yep. anything that's, uh, and then, you know, if it's not cleaned well and you get any uh, grit or abrasive under it from the shop, yeah, it'll, it just you know, wears, wears it, it right it just wears it. quicker than most people realize. Yeah. But that's why it's important that you inspect these annually. And then if it is where, if it is worn, this is what you do to make it flat again. So Keith's been over here grinding in a couple of his uh, Rucker straight edges. These, uh, again, they belong to two of the students. Get a little shot of him doing his thing. Keith has got two of his 12-inch uh, straight edges finished up. He just finished grinding them. What do you think? I think they look great. Uh, I think they machined beautifully. They ground up beautifully. And, uh, man, they, they turned out nice. They look good. Uh, we're going to – these are actually going to go to a couple of the students in the class, and they're going to be doing this as their project uh, coming up here in the next day or two once they kind of get past the basic scraping. And uh, we'll make sure everything scrapes like they should. I have no doubt that they will. Uh, but hopefully we're going to be offering these up for sale over on my website here pretty soon. And that, the scraping projects. That'll be on uh, vintagemachinery.org. Yep, vintagemachinery.org. You go to store.vintagemachinery.org and we'll have, I already have a 9-inch version. This is a 12-inch version. This is to be the second one uh, in the series. And uh, hoping to have an 18-inch coming out at some point in the future. Okay. All right. Maybe we'll get to see... <clears throat> some of the scraping on these later in the week from the students there. I hope so. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> 